Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Today we're talking about financial regulation. We're joined by our colleague Mark A. Calabria, director of financial regulation studies at the Cato Institute. Mark, the specter of Wall Street makes a lot of people – it makes it – if they're a little bit iffy about it. Just saying it, Wall Street versus Main Street makes people a little bit upset and libertarians get a, a lot little of – A little bit upset. People very, get like very enraged upset, about yeah. this stuff. And they get a lot of flack for supporting Wall Street and being against regulation. So I guess the first question is – are you against regulation and why do you want the billionaires to win? <laughs> <laughs> because clearly they're such nice people. Um, you know, so it's true that you know rarely do you hear the term Wall Street you know uses anything but a pejorative, and 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 certainly it's also used as a term for lots of things that aren't even associated with Wall Street. And so I think there is often this perception that you know Wall Street is the Wild West, untamed, you know, lack of regulation, you know, just greed let loose, you know, in its worst um, worst form. And of course, you know, as an economist and you know, a certain libertarian, we get that most people are greedy in a world of scarcity. There's nothing really particularly ungreedy here that's more greedy than somewhere else. But it really is looked at in the same way. Um, you know that's just different. Um, you know, given even though that uh, you know we may look at actors and athletes making obscene amounts of money, and nobody feels the same sort of anger toward you two that they feel, you know, toward Goldman Sachs. And so, part of that I think is a feeling that you know that you two or Death Cab for Cutie, nobody or else, LeBron James, or, 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 any, or anybody that actors and athletes, musicians, there's a sense that they earned that money fairly. You know, there's a sense of they attracted fans, they paid their dues. Whereas there's really a sense that Wall Street is rigged. That you know, the, the reason that there's so much wealth on Wall Street and so much money made is that it's stolen. And I think that that drives a lot of the animosity. Um, you know, there's always the tension uh, of. Well, is more regulation going to do any better? Because you know, let's set aside. Um, certainly, one of my great frustrations is when I hear people tell me that you know financial markets are unregulated. <laughs> there, there's nobody who actually knows what they're talking about who thinks that. Um, you know, it could be about the quality of regulation. It could be whether you think there should be more or less regulation. Uh, and certainly, what we'll talk about a little bit is whether you think this should be private sector versus public sector regulation. But we should be certainly clear that Wall Street is regulated. Uh, and also, Wall Street tends to be a catch-all for anything in the financial system we don't like. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, Dodd Frank, uh, which was the financial reform passed in 2010 in response to the crisis, you know, has a lot of uh, new rules for you know, what I would call Main Street lenders. You know, payday lenders, check cashers, and of course, it was all done under the "we need to get Wall Street." So therefore, this guy on the corner who has nothing to do with Wall Street gets regulated as well. Uh, and of course, we have 7,000 banks in the United States, uh, maybe. A hundred of them are arguably Wall Street related. You know, the vast majority of them are not. Uh, and again, there is this sense that the game is rigged. Uh, I think it's also a, a degree to which, you know, most of what goes on on Wall Street is somewhat mysterious to most of us. I mean, we understand. You know, maybe we put a little savings aside. You know, maybe we, you know watch our stocks and we care what we're going on a little bit. But you know, Wall Street uses a lot of terms, whether it's derivatives or in some cases, Wall Street, I think, does themselves a disservice, but everybody does this in terms of picking you know, terms that aren't very um, – that don't – Clear. You know, yeah, yeah, or they're also just sound a little mischievous like you know, dark pools or high frequency trading. You know, you're not, you might not be sure what those are, but they just don't sound good. <laughs> uh, and so Wall Street does a lot of that. Um, you know, but again, I suspect it's not any worse than most other professions in terms of, you know, things that were picked. Um, and there's always a degree of envy. Um, so there's, you know, they, they live. The, there's a bit of a lifestyle on Wall Street that, you know, again, this, this is different by firm. I mean, several firms have always had an attitude of you be a little less ostentatious, and other firms are, you know, you make a lot of money and you show it off and you throw money left and round. So you know, I think there's also a degree to which for most of the American public, Wall Street is that, that thing way over there in New York. So it's so distant and it's so part of a big establishment that, that is against you. So 
you know, why do we? I mean, I, I certainly run into this on a, on occasion. Uh, I, of course, I always scratch my head that after I get up and talk to people about why we should stop bailing out banks, and then they tell me I'm a front for Wall Street. But <laughs> um, all that said, you know, because you, many libertarians, myself included, are very, very skeptical of government regulate, regulation, very skeptical of things like Dodd Frank. We often get painted as Wall Street, and of course, that's also forgotten that you know Goldman Sachs came out and endorsed Dodd Frank when it was passed. So you know, so again. Um, there is this sense that you're only going to be opposing government involvement because you want to protect the industries involved rather than you oppose government involvement because that government involvement actually protects the industries involved. This is where I begin to maybe expose my profound ignorance on these matters by asking questions of this sort. But you said there are thousands of banks in the United States, but only what a hundred or so are Wall Street. What makes something Wall Street as opposed to a bank? Besides, maybe it's just geography. It happens to actually be on Wall Street, or so. Like that's a that's a great question, and and I appreciate you pushing me on it so I can define this a little better. So what we tend to think of as Wall Street is really that you're directly involved in the capital markets. You know, and I mean that in the sense of. You're a broker dealer in that you sell stock or you know you help exchange. Uh, you know you might be involved in derivatives markets. So we think about again, there are a little over seven thousand banks in the United States. Most of them are quite small, have a few locations. They take deposits from the local areas. They make loans, you know, small business loans, mortgages. They don't really do anything, you know, all too fancy. It's cookie cutter. It's I mean, despite the fact that many of them still continue to fail. It's fairly straightforward business and it's very much connected to the community. I mean, it, it is re literally in many parts of the U.S. We still have a system where, you know, you would go down to the corner and put your money in Mapa Independent Community Bank. Mapa Independent Community Bank would gather that money and you know let you lend you money to make a mortgage or to start a business. And it's often you know money raised in that community stays in that community. Very transparent. That's the the, the uh, it's a wonderful life lesson. Absolutely. Right? That's the, well, your money's not here. It's in Tom's house. And uh, yeah, and exactly. That still exists to a, to a lesser degree, but it still exists out there. And there's also this sort of bias against Wall Street that uh, you know another th term that I feel should be relatively neutral, but is used as a pejorative is speculation. Um, you know, to me, I mean, crossing the street is a speculative activity. <laughs> you may get hit by a car, but there is this sense that if I make a loan for you to get a mortgage and buy a house, that that's not speculation. That you know, let's set aside whether you think prices are going to go up or down or whatever. It's generally looked at as well. That's the real economy. Whereas you know, if you were buying a stock or buying a derivative, you know, that's looked at as speculation. So there is this sense that somehow Wall Street is gambling in a way. Uh, that others are not. Now, of course, in my opinion, that distinction is completely artificial. Um, but to get back to a more simple way of answering the question, most Wall Street banks, quote unquote, do have uh, some sort of physical presence in New York. Most of them are no longer actually on Wall Street, but that's a different issue. They've just moved a few blocks over. Um, but they're in New York. They're tied to the capital markets directly. They're often internationally active. Um, you know, a good measure is, you know, do they have a derivatives book? You know, for instance, ninety-nine percent of banks don't have a derivatives book. Um, you know, it's the bigger banks that are trading in that regard. And so, any the thing that really separates Wall Street is whether you're essentially, in my opinion, doing underwriting or selling of publicly traded securities. To me, is probably a defining characteristic. And that's the capital markets in general is how yes. you describe them. Um, now we're going to even go back a little further here because uh, we're going to ask what is a derivative, just so we can be on the same page. So a derivative is simply an instrument where the payoff is tied to some other instrument. Like um, you know, it, you know, if you and I bet on the outcome of the Super Bowl, you know, you and I aren't actually playing in the Super Bowl, but we're betting on the outcome of it. So that bet is derived from the outcome of the Super Bowl, and it's the same thing on whether you know, if I buy a pork belly future. I might not necessarily have a, take possession of those pork bellies or deliver pork bellies, but the payoff is driven by the direction of the pork belly. So it's quite simply an instrument whose value is derived from the movement of something more concrete. And of course, you can have derivatives of derivatives. Um, it's also important to keep in mind because there's a lot of mystique around derivatives. Um, just like a Super Bowl bet, the net outcome is zero. Someone loses, someone, someone gains. gains. I bet you $100, I lose, I pay you $100. There, there is no net loss. It's simply a transfer. Um, and so you often hear numbers thrown about like you know, world derivative outstanding being like $600 trillion. That's what's called notational value. 
So it adds up both sides of the trade without netting anything out. It's like saying uh, if I have a $100 bet with you on the Super Bowl, it's like saying it's a $200 bet. Well, no. It's a $100 bet and of course, again, the net is zero. So the actual risk in the system from derivatives is zero in terms of lost wealth. The real question, I think the concern about derivatives is often, you know, are people using them to hide losses? Are people using them to move losses? Are they being sold to people who don't understand them? Um, and so there's lots of questions about less the derivative than what the derivative is trying to do. And what what are they trying to do? Because I'm trying like I can understand investing in a product, investing in a company, you know, buying the pork bellies and see if they go up. But or buying Apple stock, okay. right? But what what do you what do you why would a bank do this? Why would anyone want to trade these things and then trade derivatives of derivatives? The, I mean, the bet between us for the Super Bowl, we do it because it's fun, but to turn that into a financial <laughs> yeah, they're instrument, they're not necessarily doing it for that reason. Um, so there's. Predominantly two reasons. Now, the overwhelming majority, and I really do mean, you know, we're close, you know, approaching like ninety percent of derivatives are interest rate swaps. And so, keep in mind, let's go back. Can you describe exactly what that would I'm, be? I'm, I'm okay. about to get to that. But so, let's start with our MAPA Independent Community Bank again. MAPA Independent Community Bank takes your money in deposits. And it pays you. Now, of course, in today's environment, it doesn't pay you anything on your deposits. But in a more normal interest rate environment, you get to pay it on your deposits. That rate – you know, is reset pretty regularly. And so the bank then lends out that money for long-term assets. So a mortgage could be as much as 30 years. Don't generally last that long. Even a small business loan is going to be five, seven, ten years maybe. So what the bank has done is it's borrowed very short-term in deposits and it's lent very long-term for a fixed rate almost always. Mm -hmm. Now, there, it could – the bank could decide that it's just going to lend adjustable rate and borrow adjustable rate and that risk goes away. But that's for a variety of reasons. You generally don't see that. So in most situations, the situation facing the bank is that I have lent you a long amount – long-term money on your mortgage, let's say 5 percent for the sake of argument. I face the risk that if rates start going up from inflation or otherwise, I can be in a situation where I'm paying more to borrow than I am getting when I lend. And of course, that's what got the SNL the savings loan industry. I mean, try to fan this. The entire savings loan industry, every single savings loan in the United States was insolvent in the late nine, late seventies when interest rates. Their went liabilities up. were bigger than their yep, assets because they were they had these mortgages for long dated that were you know four five six percent, and they had to pay you know the I think the. Uh, Federal funds rate in the early 80s got and up that's to something the, that's like the, Fed. The, the overnight rate, which is a proxy for short-term rates. So you literally had a situation where um, you had to pay 12, 13, 14 percent for money in which you were getting a return of 6 percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're kind of bankrupt. And so we really saw growth in derivatives market after that. So interestingly enough, you really saw very little use of derivatives before Nixon took us off gold in 71 and, and so because you saw a lot more stability in currency markets, you saw a lot more stability in interest rate markets. But again, the overwhelming majority of derivatives used by banks are to hedge interest rate risk. So that's one. The second one that gets talked about a lot are, are things that are called credit default swaps. So keep in mind, there are at least two basic risks in a loan. One is the interest rate risk that you know you get paid um, back less money than you lend out. The other part is you don't get paid back. And we think Just of that default. as default. Yes. Yeah. So you know, in, like let's go back to our uh, Super Bowl analogy for a second. You know, Trevor and I make a bet on the Super Bowl. Um, I win that bet. Hooray for me. However, let's say Trevor's a deadbeat. It <laughs> doesn't want to pay me. Or Trevor goes bankrupt. Let's be generous. Or Trevor gets hit by a car or something you know, after the game or something. So let's say for so whatever reason, despite the fact that I've won the bet, I'm not going to get paid. And that's a credit risk or, or a counterparty risk. And so one of the things that really took a, a special interest during the financial crisis were these things called credit default swaps. And what a credit default swap is, it is a derivative where it's hedging a particular credit risk. So it wasn't unusual, for instance, for a bank to buy lots of GM bonds and then buy a credit default sw swap so that if GM defaulted, it would get paid by somebody else on those bonds. So let, let me let me turn sure. this back. Uh, you buy a bunch of GM bonds which have a risk to actually go under at some point. You could lose nothing. So then you buy a different instrument on the other side 
which is trying to keep that risk that you'll lose everything on the GM yeah, bonds. This sounds like an insurance plan. It, it, it is in a way. And of course, there's a whole separate conversation of why don't we regulate these things like insurance. Um, but so one way to think about derivatives and I, you know, since I'm with two lawyers, maybe I can sort of think about this is um, it's like your sticks and your bundle of rights. And it's really – if you think about it, any one instrument has a variety of different sticks of different types of risk. And so what derivatives allow you to do is pull out those different sticks and parse them out to whichever party is willing to bear that risk for the lowest cost. And so you might say, I'll take that credit risk for X. You know, I'll take that interest rate risk for X. So of course there are regulatory reasons. I mean there's a whole different regulatory reason why banks loaded up on credit default swaps when they might not have. But the underlying fact about derivatives is they are a facilitator for you to essentially split instruments into finer and finer pieces of risk and diversify those risks to various parties. And to me, I think that overall they are a very positive development. So let's go back to the big picture then, because uh, people might be saying, well, how do the financial markets then help the economy? Uh, they can understand the house. Uh, so the first one would be uh, unless you want to pay all cash up front for everything you buy right now, you could never own a house, right? And that's a good thing if you like to own a house, possibly. <laughs> or you could build one yourself. Uh, or you could build one for yourself. So they help you buy houses and then – but anyone who's going to lend you that money to buy a house is going to have a risk of yeah. losing that money. So they want to have some sort of hedging themselves against that risk. But there's a lot of other things that these financial markets help do. They try and predict the future, right? Isn't that kind of what they're doing? So, so you, you get to what I think is an important part and, and the way I think about the role of financial institutions is primarily really this sort of intertemporal exchange and almost in some sense an intertemporal like charging things to future people and in, 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 in a very big way to a future self. And so let's keep in mind that um, for starters, most people kind of have a U-shaped earnings profile. You know, you don't make as much when you're twenty when you're twenty five than is when you're fifty five. And so in some ways, when everything works well, what the financial markets let you kind of do is your 25-year-old self borrow from your 55-year-old self in so that either you can make those investments today or you can buy that house today or you can get that student loan today. Um, and so of course what we're really doing is instead of you actually borrowing from your 55-year-old self, your 25-year-old self is borrowing from this other 55-year-old over here yeah. who stands in for you in a way. So. The role of financial institutions is on a very basic level to match savers and borrowers. Um, and you know, of course, you can have economies where there's you know uh, one, a lack of one or the other, um, but it does allow you to borrow and in a way um, that allows you to invest or allows you to even consume today. And increase your capital and your earning yes. potential. So if you want to start a business, if you want to do something, it allows you to find the person out there who has that money uh, and then allows them to hedge against the risk that you're not going to make the money in the future and then everyone starts trading those risks between it, it, each other. Exactly. So it allows them to be diversified. So you could certainly um, – you know, for instance, and, and I am very encouraging and optimistic about you know growth in peer-to-peer -peer lending and, and these sorts of things. But I think they're always going to be relatively small because, OK, let's go back to this example and say, um, you know, rather than you know, you you're not going to be able to find the 55 year old you because you can't go into the future. So the 25 year old finds some other 55 year old. Um, as, you sort, as you sort of touched upon, there's not a lot of diversification there, and and many of these, and, and that's actually one of the things that and if the 55 year old gives you everything, he's highly risky. Oh yeah, yeah. So you know, so one of the ways that financial institutions try this is have all the 55 year olds pull their money together so they can lend all the 25 year olds, and that their default risks are somewhat, uh, you know, estimatable. They're somewhat bearable. And of course, it's interesting because a lot of the newer sort of peer to peer online lending services have tried to find ways to diversify so that you don't get caught in this bilateral issue. But then you also get the problem of if you simply pulled, you know, 155 year olds and they lend it to 125 year Olds, well, who's going to monitor the twenty-five-year-olds? Who's going to make sure that you know they don't go spend all that money on beer and pizza? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. of course, that they want to spend money on beer and pizza, that's fine too, as long as they're you know the, the market would charge them a higher rate. And so, what financial institutions have largely ended up doing is trying to serve that sort of monitoring role. So they screen borrowers. That's a big thing that they're supposed to do is try to be the expert. Um, you know, and this is really one of the biggest changes we've seen in the financial markets. Prior, let's go back to that Jimmy Stewart world you mentioned. Prior to like the 1980s, lending really was done a lot on a face-to-face -face basis, and so you certainly saw 
you know, you looked at credit ratios, you looked at people's ability to pay, but a really big part, and if you go back and look at textbooks on lending and, and, and real estate and such from the 60s, 70s or even earlier, there's always something mentioned called character. You know, and so what really you got to be good at as a lender that distinguished you is you had a really good get sense of is this guy across the table going to pay me back or not? And that kind of sounds kind of glib but it really is that sort of tacit knowledge of time and place that would made a good lender. In to me, I think we've lost a lot of that in our financial system. But the underlying point is that a very big part in addition to matching buyers, borrowers and, 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 and savers is that financial institutions monitor and discipline both sides of that equation. So it really is a division of labor in the marketplace. Trevor And that seems like how we create competition then in that which goes back to this question of market regulation versus government regulation. Well, before we get to what the government does about this or the ways the government can muck it up, I'm curious. I mean the, the picture that you've given seems pretty, o pretty OK in the sense that like so these, these financial institutions are helping people who need money to borrow by spreading out the risk and facilitating lending and, and all that sounds great. But we're constantly hearing about lots of bad behavior by these institutions. So what is – how does bad behavior fit into this or what does bad behavior look like in this picture? Trevor Burrus Trevor Burrus Trevor Burrus Trevor you know, let's let's try to separate out the the bad micro behavior from the bad macro behavior, and I'm, when I'm, we'll get to the bad macro behavior later. So the bad micro behavior would simply be fraud. So for starters, financial institutions deal primarily in cash. I mean, or you know, or some sort of transaction. And so if you can, you know, contrast that to you know, you're working in a factory. You know, you're working in a tractor factory in Indiana somewhere. You'd like to steal from the factory. You know, what are you going to do? Walk out with a tractor? I mean, maybe you could. Um, but my point being is that one of the reasons that financial institutions have been more fraud prone, embezzlement prone, is because the assets in which they deal with are so much more fungible than any other industry. Uh, and you can I could just change something on a computer. That's all. You don't even yeah, have to walk out with a with exactly. A now, now that, that's like all you need to do now, and and so it's just become. It's just what they deal in is so much you know, easier and of course I think actually the computer part of it will make it in, over the long run harder because you'll be able to trace things easier than when it was all cash. Um, and so that's part of it. Now part of it of course is that um, you, know, you have lots of bad behavior on the part of borrowers. Uh, you have, and so it certainly should be kept in mind that bad behavior cuts across you know, the, the spectrum here. Sure. Um, I think you've also had – and we'll get into this a little bit more later. I think you've had more bad behavior in the financial services industry because of the regulatory barriers to entry. Um, it's very hard to start yes. a new trading firm with a new idea for how to do things better. Absolutely. So, so entry is very difficult. Uh, and so historically, the way you've gotten around these issues before the imposition of government is you had to build up a reputation. Um, you had to have uh, you know, some sort of you know, credit comes from you know, the drive from the landlord tr for trust basically. And so you have to develop that reputation. Um, you often would have to put your own money in. So early bankers uh, often put most of their own money in. While the typical commercial bank today is leveraged 10 to 1, which means that you know, for every dollar of equity, oh, the owner's own money, there's another you know, 10 there um, of debt. The traditional early banking system was far more equity driven. You know, it was far more your money at risk. Um, and of course, part of this also grew out of you know a lot of banking grew out of this sort of storehousing of gold and other um, other precious minerals and goods. But again, you had to develop that sort of trust. And, and again, that to me is a big part of it. But underlying reason, um, I don't think it's that what what is inherently the problem. For attracting fraud is just because the asset and liabilities are so fungible. So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, now that we have some sort of at least okay grip on maybe what's going on here, uh, let's go back to by the beginning. I don't necessarily mean the the Fed. Adam and Eve I, the, or Fed, I don't, the Fed. I'd rather avoid to not get into monetary policy. I mean, we'll come up a little bit, but at least for financial regulation itself, we're really let's go back to SEC and maybe the FDIC and the story sure. that the way that you see the story for how markets. You know, the market regulation maybe worked, and then the SEC and different entities came in. So the SEC was first, I think, at thirty four, maybe at the same time, thirty three and thirty four. Yeah. And, and we can actually, so it's certainly worth pointing out too that um, just at, 
just as we don't have a free market in banking and finance today, we've never actually had a free market in banking and finance in the United States. Uh, and so very early on, uh, after the founding of our republic, you had many banks were set up by, this, by states. Um, you for a very long time had entry restrictions. So it's been a very highly regulated industry since day one essentially in the United States. Now, because of that, um, going into the Great Depression, you had a very large number, thousands and thousands of bank failures. Um, actually, many of these were even before 1929 because you had the housing, the real estate market um, peak in 25, 26. You had a lot of these ag banks fail. And so we saw wave after wave of bank failure in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, foremost because at that time you had these very stringent regulations on entry. And even up until the 1990s in Texas, a bank could only have a single location. Now, of course, if you think about it, if you were stuck – and again, this is an extreme example but not all that uncommon. If you're the one bank in town and the one big employer goes to, in town goes out of business. You're done. Yeah, you're done as a bank. So we had a pretty big lack of geographic diversification of the banking system. You know, the really comparison that people and the banking scholars often use is looking at Canada during that time. And so Canada had a similar decline in GDP during the Great Depression in the United States. They had, you know, they're even more dependent on ag than we are. Yet they had six very large banks and had zero bank failures. Because they, they were diversified. They were diversified. Um, they had private lending arrangements, clearing houses. So and again, they had much less regulation at the time. They were much less leveraged. Uh, and it's also fairly important to keep in mind that you know, the reaction that we saw after the Great Depression where the separation of you know, what's known as Glass-Steagall now, the separation of investment commercial banking actually played very small role. The vast majority of bank failures in the Great Depression were small agricultural banks that had almost no involvement in Wall Street, most of which failed before 29. Trevor And you had things like the Dust Bowl and other – so no. if you were only corn farmers putting deposits in your bank, or and getting loans, and then all the corn oh, yeah. crop dies, then you're then you're done. Just yeah. like the so, same you, so again, you really didn't have a spreading out of that risk. Uh, and of course, there are lots of it's a far broader conversation, but there are lots of reasons monetary policy to deal with during that time why you had some of these problems. But again, you know, it's not like the U.S. is alone in bad monetary policy. Canada had bad monetary policy during that time too, and still came out of this better than the United States. And so it's also important to keep in mind later on as we, there were moves to, to, to go off gold, you saw a lot of banks fail because people basically said, I'd like to have my gold, so I'm going to go pull out of the bank. And of course, we saw a modern day parallel with that uh, where when there was a worry about Greece leaving the euro area, you know, people literally took their money out of – about a third of the deposits left the Greek banking system and went under people's pillows. Because they wanted to keep the euros, and we saw that's an image of the depression. Yeah, we, too. we saw the same thing in the '30s when the fear of the U.S. going off gold. People basically pulled all their gold out of banks, and of course, that shrunk the banking system, and it didn't help the economy such. But all that leads up to that, rightly or wrongly, in the 1930s, a number of decisions were made, um, and it's interesting because this was actually fairly well debated at the time. For instance, I mentioned Glass Steagall. Um, that's named. Well, first, make, yeah, make sure to tell us what that is because people have probably heard that before. It's sort of often talked about. So, Glass Steagall is uh, a, a, a prohibition that was put in in 1933 that separates out investment banking, that is, that Wall Street activity, from commercial banking, so that's taking the deposits. Uh, it was named after Senator Carter Glass of Virginia. Uh, who was also Treasury Secretary uh, under Woodrow Wilson uh, and also Henry Stiegel from Alabama. And the interesting thing at the time was there was a debate, pretty serious, strong debate between the two of them over the causes of the crisis. This, unlike say Dodd-Frank where I think 90 percent of the stuff, Dodd and Frank were on the same page. Carter Glass really was a big skeptic of um, this – uh, fragmented banking system. So Carter Car Glass's initial proposal was to allow nationwide branch banking. Uh, he was a really big push for that. Uh, Henry Stiegel, un unsurprisingly from the rural south in Alabama where the unit banks were very powerful, said no way. Uh, let's instead set up the deposit insurance system. And of course, this is another one of those odd examples of we had a seven or eight state level deposit insurance systems before the FDIC was created 
every single one of them failed and failed badly. So it's one of this sort of like, let's experiment at the state level. OK, if we learn this is a really bad ideal, let's do it at the federal level now. Yeah. So um, – but the point being, so for the House to go – to sign on and a number of other things that were included in the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. Um, that were wanted that they included the federal deposit insurance, and it's interesting that even FDR at the time said that if we enact this, we will subsidize bad bank behavior and have more bank failures. So he, he was dead right on that one. Well, let's look at that point because I mean, well, that seems I mean that seems obvious because you talked about so earlier. There's this character thing that you sit down across the table from somebody who wants to borrow and you make this judgment about whether they can pay you back, and your money's on the line, so you want to make sure that they're going to be good for mm -hmm. it, but. If suddenly I know that I'm going to – if I make that – Get paid either way. Yeah, I get paid either way. Then yeah. what incentive do I ever have to make – to put that effort into making good loans? And I think that's a good general theory because you look at FDIC that way and see how market actors could discipline their banks if they paid attention to whether or not they're going to fail. And then maybe we start to see how market see, regulation could occur in financial sector And of course in that's assuming that these market actors want to be disciplined, which of course these small unit banks did not did not want to be disciplined. And so, you know, so let's step back and, and talk a little theoretical before we before we go back to the substance. And so you know, and, and let me also Push aside very quickly. Um, one of the criticisms you often hear, you know, of, of libertarians and, and, and people like myself who, who want to have free markets and banking is that somehow we, you know, believe self-regulation is, is the answer. Well, we don't. Um, you know, I come from a general premise that um, I don't care if you're the president of the United States. I don't care if you're the president of J.P. Morgan. You're not capable of being the judge of your own actions. And so just as many of us are aware of the checks and balances, I don't want to get myself too much trouble with my constitutional <laughs> scholars here, but just as you have those checks and balances in government to try to make sure the president keeps the you know keeps keeps the general interest in mind, a market only works well when there are those checks and balances on the behavior of management, on the behavior of C, uh, of the CEO, on the behavior of, of everybody in the bank in that way. And so what you know I would advocate is what we ultimately want to have is how do you maximize the quality and quantity of monitoring of behavior within the financial institutions? And so you would have that in some way by the person who lends money has something on the line. Uh, and this matters whether it's uh, a bank in which somebody has you know, some big financier has lent a billion dollars to and therefore cares what they do with it versus the bank uh, versus you as the depositor has lent money to the bank and you care what they do with it. Um, there certainly is a lot of debate um, within the financial uh, academia over whether depositors actually discipline banks. And so the literature largely says that um, large dollar depositors do discipline banks. So uh, there's really very little evidence to the contrary. And so the real question is whether, you know, is the person with $1,000 or $10,000 in the bank going to discipline the bank or not? Um, but that said, if you have deposit insurance, you're essentially telling the depositors, don't worry. And so you've created you know, what we call in any sort of insurance market, public or private, a moral hazard, which is of course that you're incentivized to take more risk than you would otherwise because you're not being monitored. You're essentially not being regulated. So you start out with a situation where the government comes in and provides a guarantee. The person receiving that guarantee, in this case the depositor or any other type of creditor, suddenly says, well, I'm guaranteed. I don't have to care. Now, of course, there's a whole other theory within academia saying, well, that's what you want because if you don't give guarantees, then people panic. And so there is a very big vein uh, of literature arguing that financial crises solely come about because of panic and you know we all freak out and run for the doors. Um, let me also say there's a, a lot of evidence saying that that's not simply the case, that um, deposits flow from good from bad banks to good banks and that people in the marketplace aren't per while not perfect are pretty good at distinguishing the insolvent poorly run banks from the, from the well run banks. But let's get back to the you give creditors a guarantee and depositors are of course creditors. They no longer care about the behavior of the institution because they get paid either way. Now, of course, in that case, and this is where I actually do agree you have to have some sort of market – some, some sort of government regulation come in. If the government has come in and created a moral hazard, you have set up a situation where you were incentivized risk-taking. Um, now, 
in that case, you could have government regulations that come in and set capital standards and set activity standards. Now, unfortunately, you also have government regulations that might come in and say, well, let's limit entry because you know, if we give this guy a monopoly, he's less likely to go out of business because he's got something worth holding on to. And of course, there's a very long academic literature about charter value, capturing franchise value as creating stability in the banking industry. Wait, you know, what do you mean, chart light? So that um, because charters are limited, in bank number, charters, bank, bank charters. charters. So that we only give out so many bank charters. You know, we're essentially handing out monopolies. Those monopolies are worth something. You have a very strong incentive not to mess up because I've given you something of value which you lose and which you mess up. And so that re was really a driving theory within both academia and, and even in practice. Uh, let's not forget, even today, um, you can't open a bank without having the regulators look at your impact on competitors. And if you have a negative impact on competitors in that locality, they won't let you open the bank. No, it's it's explicitly anti-competitive. And, yes. and it's often because it, you know we could have another – we could have an hour-long competition about ruinous competition and such. But there really is a mentality that came out of the 30s and, and a precursor of that of a sense of – if you have too much competition, that's what drives the banks you know, out of business. And of course, this is a world in which you have very little market discipline. So my fundamental concern with our system of banking regulation is you've had the regulators basically come in and provide these safety nets that say, don't worry. So we've essentially lessened the market discipline you would get from creditors and we've attempted to substitute that with having regulators um, try to offset that with various types of regulation. Now, there's a couple of concerns I have with that because in theory, you could say that might work. Well, you know, we'll, 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 we'll pay the Tim Geithners of the world a lot of money. They're specialists. We'll only get these really smart PhDs from Harvard and of course, they're going to do a better job regulating you know, than the man on the street. Well, it turns out for a variety of well-known reasons that doesn't actually tend to be the case. Maybe foremost among those is that um, creditors have very strong incentives. When your money is on the line, you care. Um, it's normally been the case that after each financial crisis, approximately zero regulators actually get fired or disciplined. So of course you're embarrassed. You know, you might get called up before Congress and yelled at, and your friends might make fun of you, or whatever. Or you might be actually able to go on a book tour and make a lot of money. <laughs> so um, it, there's just very weak incentives from the financial regulator than there are relative um, to the depositors and, and other creditors. And so of course it's also important to keep in mind. For 96 percent of the banks, their funding is almost exclusively depositors. You know, for the bigger banks, the JP Morgan's, Bank of America's of the world, you know, somewhere between a fourth and a half of their funding might be non-deposit creditors. And so you have that incentive problem, weak incentives on the part of regulators, strong incentives on the part of um, creditors. Um, but you also have the political aspect to it as well. You know, it's highly unlikely that you find a situation where government comes in, creates market power creates monopoly rents and lets you keep all those monopoly rents. They usually don't do that. It's funny that way. <laughs> usually they come in and they ask for something. And so a lot of what we see in banking regulation in my opinion, you know, that looks like it's kind of banks versus government is really an argument over the distribution of rents. It's not it's not really an argument over the basic structure. Let's let's, let's explore that. So they they have a some sort of monopoly or market power that is given to them in some way by government. Um, and then – Which leads them to then make more it. money than they yeah. would have otherwise. Absolutely. And so then you're saying government doesn't want – doesn't want to just let them keep that. So where does it go? So is government – do you mean like government wants to increase taxes on them? So or? there's a variety of ways that this would, this would work. And so um, I mean the, the, the bottom line is government spreads it pretty widely. But let's talk about some of the ways in which government might spread it. So government might spread it and of course requiring you to buy a certain amount of government debt. So for instance, when the national banking system was created at the end of the Civil War, uh, near the end of the Civil War rather, how much you could lend as a bank was a direct multiple of how much government debt you bought. So if you bought no government that debt – That was part of the charter. Yeah, oh, that was part of the charter. So if you bought no government debt, you did no lending. And so in every extra dollar you wanted to lend, you had to have X percent more government debt. So um, you know, and often there was an expectation that the government necessarily wasn't even going to get paid back. You were just going to keep rolling over government debt. So the foremost way in which governments have shared in that mon those monopoly rents is essentially either direct transfers. You pay a chartering fee. Um, I fascinate, you know, fascinated and astounded by the fact that between eighteen twenty and eighteen forty, about um, 
almost half of the revenue of the state of Massachusetts derived from its banking industry the, for the government of the state of Massachusetts. That was an outlier. Um, but states set up these, these mechanisms where the banks basically funded them as fiscal agents. We see that today. Um, still, I mean, one of the reasons, of course, that the banks in Greece and Italy were bailed out was because they were the largest holders of Greek and Italian debt, and you know nobody is going to sub- Italians and Greeks will not pay the taxes that are required to support the level of wealth their fate that, welfare that they would like, and the only way they deficit finance is with the banks. And so, so fiscal transfer is one way. Uh, another transfer is requiring you to. Um, do hidden subsidies to preferred consumers. So we think about in the United States things like Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, we think about the GSEs, Fannie Freddie's housing goals. What these essentially are is that we give you a privilege that's worth something. You share part of the value of that privilege with select constituencies, which would then therefore vote for us. So there are other ways in which you're maximizing that public support. In one of the ways that um, I mentioned earlier that you had this fragmented banking system. The reason that it was stable for a very long time was because part of the rent, um, part of the rents, if you will, the monopoly rents, were shared with the agricultural community in, in the way that the system was set up. So it's important to keep in mind that the political equilibrium between the banks and the governments is rarely one where it's just banks and government. There's almost always some other collection of parties. Um, you know, in a shorthand way of thinking about this as American history is we went from a system of very fragmented small banks who partnered with the ag community um, to essentially extort the rest of us to a system now where we have fairly large too big to fail banks who have partnered with uh, community activists to extort from the rest of us. So the, 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 the people have changed and of course some of this is because of the SNL crisis revealed uh, the frigidity of the fragmented banking system. You know, you really had this situation where the reason that we allow nationwide banking now is because the regulators didn't want to recognize, Congress did not want to recognize the cost of literally an entire industry that was insolvent. And so they allowed other you know, banks and other SNLs to buy each other and merge each other. And the only way to do that, to paper up the losses, was to allow that to go across state lines. Um, just like in some ways that we saw um, – you know that that you that you saw uh, you know Bank of America buy Merrill Lynch. It was really a way that we didn't have to admit that Merrill Lynch was insolvent. In the same way with J.P. Morgan buying Bear, although we admitted some of that insolvency in a more transparent manner. Um, so again, for banks to sort of function in this political environment, they've almost always got to have some sort of partner. Uh, certainly, there have been times in history where the partner has been the government. So almost you know, of course, as we know the. Um, Bank of England started out being a monopoly chartered bank that was there to fund the crown, exclusively there to fund the crown. So you know, certainly as a historical matter and of course this is one of the toughest things for those of us who want to move to a free banking system is that with a small number of exceptions, banking historically has been very tightly wed to the state primarily as a captive vehicle for financing for the state. So this sounds like you're – in this Occupy Wall Street Tea Party, in the sense of saying you, there is a lot of collusion, co- collusion <laughs> between Wall Street regulators and banks, and and maybe the you know fundamental difference from the Occupy Wall Street versus your position is that they think that there's some way to clean up that regulation and make it better, put in a different super regulator on top of the regulators who messed up, but definitely don't let the greedy Wall Street people do this on their own. And, and I think you would probably disagree with that. So what I would say the, the part I would disagree with is you know the sense that if we just you know um, you know, held more scrutiny to the regulatory system um, that it would somehow come out different. To me, the regulatory system we have is largely the outcome of the political coalition, the political economy we, we, we work under. Ian, that's a harder thing to fix. Um, you know, certainly it seems to me that the more complicated the banking regulation is, the more likely the industry is going to have the expertise to capture it and work it to their benefit. So I would certainly say that I think that there's a very close relationship between the banking industry and the government. Um, very little of it is an argument about the overall framework. Again, it's it's mostly an argument about the distribution of, of monopoly rents, who gets to keep how much, you know, how much gets redistributed. Um, it's probably more so a, a case of an agreement between the politicians and the banks than it is between the regulators. Um, I think most regulators, even though that they face pretty weak incentives, are generally focused on safety and soundness of the banks. 
Um, it's really quite interesting. I mean, the reason that you had this new consumer agency, the consumer product, um, uh, you know, this bureau created out of Dodd Frank, the consumer advocates long complained that the bank regulators cared too much about safety and soundness. And what they meant by that is, and therefore they wouldn't, you know, nudge banks to encourage banks to make bad loans. You know, and of course, of course, if my consumer advocate friends were here, they would say bad loans. You mean loans to more, loans more risky, to, lower, yes, lower yes. income people. So the idea being that the consumer finance, uh, consumer finance protection right. bureau uh, would be there to protect the little guy who is being discriminated against by the bank because they were too risky. But there's another social justice. And I'm putting that in scare quotes. View of this that <laughs> that's, 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 that's a wrong. You, you should not be discriminated against if you have no income, no assets, no I mean, job. And, and of course, I mean, part of the problem is, that, as I mentioned, you know, because you've essentially given these monopoly-style rents to the banking system, it's looked at as an off-balance sheet way to address a variety of social wrongs. And so, um, like, take the issue of we know, for instance, that credit scores, credit history, vary dramatically by race and ethnicity. Um, you could have all sorts of debates about why. Uh, so you know, if you want to feel like that, you know whether. So I guess I put it this way: there has been a very strong desire to use the financial system as a remedy to all sorts of social wrongs. Now I'm quite skeptical of that. I mean, to, you know, let's have a debate if we want reparations or we want welfare, or we want ever. Let's put it on budget. Let's debate it. Let's have it above board. Um, but again, you know, politicians are much more attracted to, you know, why would I want to tax? which nobody really likes if I can spend off budget via the financial system and hand out subsidies that way. And so that's been the attractiveness of the banking system. Now, you'll certainly hear among my consumer advocate friends, you know, that well, the banks are just ripping people off and they're not making they're making bad loans to creditworthy people. Um, by and large, I think that that's grossly exaggerated. Uh, there certainly is fraud. There's certainly people taking advantage of. But to me, the studies that have looked at this, you know, the overwhelming determinant of whether someone's going to pay the loan is the credit quality of the borrower, and that matters much more than whether they're an adjustable rate versus a fixed rate mortgage. And of course, job loss is also the predominant driver of uh, financial distress, regardless of the financial instrument. So. You saw this bureau created to try to take this out of the bank regulators. And of course, I'll set aside that I don't know how anybody after 500 bank failures says that the regulators care too much about bank safety. <laughs> My take is they didn't care enough. But that said, you know, there is this sense of there being a trade-off. And so you created this new bureau to actually – so the politicians could take consumer – quote, unquote, consumer protection or rather, you know, consumer redistribution out of the hands of the bank regulators who were too concerned about the stability of the banking system and put it somewhere else where they wouldn't be so concerned about the stability of the banking system. Trevor Couldn't someone say though that there's a, there's a meaningful difference between encouraging banks to give loans to lower income, more risky people versus giving those people subsidies or handouts sure. or something in the, in the same way that we might say there's a difference between as far as someone's quality of life between giving someone – Welfare checks and helping them get a job. I, and, I, and I would agree. And so, you know, it's interesting because I think the Community Reinvestment Act had a reasonable purpose at the time. Can we explain exactly what that is. Okay. For, it was well, it's 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 morphed into a lot of things. So it's actually the the Community Reinvestment Act is actually a very short statute that's very clear. That's just about process. And it was set up in a world in which you still had these local monopolies. Now, and let's go back to our Econ 101. If you have a monopoly, the incentive for monopolist is what? To restrict output. And so what that means is that these local monopolies, they're not making as lend much lending as you would see in a competitive market. People who are credit worthy but are on the margin will not get credit. And so CRA was a response to this by basically saying, OK, we're going to keep your local monopoly, but we're going to nudge that supply curve out a little bit. You know, we're going to nudge it out to people within the community. So I do think the CRA at the time it was passed in 1977 identified a very real problem. The, the oddity of it was probably a decade later that problem had been gone because you know we have whatever for good or bad fairly competitive banking markets today in the United States that we did not have in the 70s but you saw CRA morph into into something that became much more quota driven over in the 90s when the regulations were changed um, and so I do think that you have to worry about if you set up monopolies that they're going to restrict supply and it's not random who they restrict supply to uh, and so you do see more marginal credits. 
Um, it's certainly you know, very worth remembering and reminding ourselves that we had a tremendous amount of racial discrimination in the housing mortgage market. Uh, it's certainly worth pointing out that some of that did come from the government. The term redlining is actually came from FHA who literally and, – and here in Washington, they drew red lines around certain parts of the map and said the federal government will not lend in these areas because of the you know, uncertainty and instability of the racial makeup of the neighborhood. That was something that uh, FDR's good folks decided. Um, so that said, you, you certainly had these very real um, things. And so this is one of the tensions I mentioned earlier, that nature of character. And so we also not only passed the area, we passed the, the Fair Housing Act. And so you really saw a lot of pressure on banks to move away from subjective decision making. And you know, to me, on one hand, I think that has resulted in a tremendous reduction of racial discrimination in, in the mortgage market and the lending markets in general and the data bear that out. And so anybody who acts like it's still 1970, I, I have to scratch my head because it's clearly not and the data are, are very clear on that fact. Um, and so on one hand, the move away from subjective decision making based on character re resulted in an expansion of credit and a reduction in discrimination. That's good. What's bad, of course, is we also lost some of the subjectivity in the process uh, that really judged character. And so you got we've gotten to a situation where you, you don't even people don't even talk about character and credit decisions anymore. It's all based on the numbers. Um, it's all based on the ratios. It is a very model-driven world that the banking industry has become. And I think because of that, we really have squeezed that tacit knowledge out of the system in a bad way. Is there evidence about how that works in practice? I guess I'm curious, do, do the kind of gut instincts that go into a character judgment, do those work better than the adding up all of these metrics and numbers on a flowchart and picking someone? So there's two elements to this and let me talk to the element that's maybe most relevant for the crisis and then get back to the broader point. So one of the reasons we had uh, you know, a, a contributor and, I, and I'm certainly somebody who, who thinks there are at least a dozen if not more contributors to the financial crisis was we developed these models in a world in which there was subjectivity. So for the economists out there, listen, there's they might remember the Lucas critique. If you have a regime change, the coefficients you've developed in your previous regime cannot be used in your new regime. They will be biased. New subjective. New, new, new people are enforcing rules in different ways so they so it changes the, yeah, the model. Exactly. So my point is we developed all these models of default behavior in a world in which subjectivity entered. And then but we didn't count that subjectivity, obviously, because it couldn't be fit to the regression. And then once you squeeze the subjectivity out of the process, those models were still being used based on that previous data. So um, that's one reason why a lot of the default models that were used in the banking industry grossly underestimated the performance during the crisis. They were just based on a different world. Uh, they were based on a world in which we had unobserved variables. The subjectivity character was actually included in the model even if it wasn't specified and then it wasn't. So then again, you, your models broke down. Now, the other part of it, of course, is that we had this massive expansion of subprime lending which we really did not have before the 90s. So you didn't have an inflection point and trying to predict changes without an inflection point and change in your data. What do you mean an inflection point? So subprime mortgage data – really only goes back to the early 90s and so the last housing market bottomed out 93, 94. So essentially you were predicting subprime performance on a straight line of the housing market and so unless you have a turning point, which is your inflection point, then you really don't know how they're going to perform. You just think it's all going up. Yeah, you just think it's all going up and so you know, what they were basing that on was of course we had data for the prime market because we had the late 90s and early – the late 80s and early 90s where in some places like New England, it performed horribly. Um, and so you had data there for the prime market and then they're essentially trying to forecast out a sample. You know, they were looking at, well, this is how prime borrowers perform in a bad market and so we're just, you know, kind of assume a little bit, fudge a little – throw a couple of fudge factors in the equation and assume that we know how sub subprime borrowers perform. And so it's also important to keep in mind prior to the, to the 90s and, and certainly the 80s, subprime borrowers basically didn't get loans and it's also important to keep in mind we are the only developed country in the world where if you have a history of not paying your bills, you can still get a mortgage. You know, that, that's unheard of in you know, socialist France. If you don't pay your mortgage, they garnish your wages and they won't even give you one if you've ever not you know, been late on anything. So part – and that's of course in my opinion part of the political coalition we have that maintains the, the monopoly rents in the banking system is you have this coalition 
um, of essentially subprime borrowers who would not get credit otherwise. And now um, we don't we don't have that much time, and this might be opening up a big big uh, bag of, of worms. <laughs> but so now we have Dodd Frank. Um, which is supposed to solve some of these problems. Uh, and, and so how is it supposed to do that uh, and, and will it do that in any meaningful way or should we be afraid that the government is coming in and once again messing be, be things very, up? Be very, very afraid. Be very, very afraid. Not just afraid. Okay. Very, very, very afraid. afraid. So let's start out. So the theory of Dodd-Frank is essentially that you had a run in the non-bank parts of the financial system, you know, an old style bank run. And so the theory of Dodd Frank is we simply expand the non bank meaning like oh, oh. yeah so the Lehman Brothers the investment banks insurance companies uh, they the even the, the shadow banking is a term that's used often without actually defining it very well and and would also mean sort of Fannie and Freddie except they were explicitly ignored in Dodd Frank and so the sense was well you know if we just expanded an FDIC safety net to everybody else we would stop panics okay. and, you know and that's really the theory of Dodd Frank is you know i usually my quip is that um the theory of Dodd Frank is that if we only regulate everybody else as well as we regulated Citibank, everything will be fine. And of course, as we know, Citibank, <laughs> Citibank been bailed out four times. Yes, and yeah. so that is the theory behind it. So, as you could imagine, I'm very, very scared and, and worried that it will not only uh, not avoid future crises but make them more likely. And so, while Dodd Frank deserves a lot of criticism, it really is an extension of the previous system where we are expanding government safety nets with the promise that government regulators will come in this time. Let's forget whether they did or not last time. That they will come in this time and control the moral hazard that those safety nets create. And of course, part of the problem is that you know I think the fundamental problem here, of course, is that uh, as I like to quip, democracy loves a bubble. You know, during a boom, it's very hard for any politician, any regulator to push back. We all sit around talking about how much we sold our house for and you know this and that. And so what – nobody's ever got to win on re-election on I'm going to bring the value of your house down. And so you know, leaning against the wind is just something the political system does not do. I saw it when I was on the staff of the banking committee in the Senate. You really saw the regulators bend to the will within their discretion and let's keep in mind – most of Dodd-Frank has actually delegated decisions made by the bank regulators, not by the Congress themselves. The bank regulators bend to the will of Congress. Congress bends to the popular euphoria. And so my problem with our current system of regulation and I think you know, we're stuck with this is that it's extremely pro-cyclical. It ends up making the booms bigger and the bus deeper than you would have in a purely market system. Uh, and because it does end up just echoing you know, the positive sort of boom mentality rather than actually bringing a pessimistic side to this. And so you don't get you know, like the downside of, hey, maybe this is a little crazy. So final question. Uh, you seem like you, – you, do you believe in no regulations or I mean, that's the question. Do you believe in no regulations, prefer market? What, what is the simplest way well, you can explain your view I think of how we should approach these problems? I think ultimately we need to rely on market participants regulating each other and they will only do so with very strong incentives to do so such as that their own money is at risk. Uh, I think if we have a system that is reliant upon government regulators, um, then we will have a system that repeatedly fails. Uh, I think if we have a system where we tell creditors not to care about – if we tell creditors like depositors not to care about the quality of loans, the quality of activities that banks engage in, then we're going to get poor quality. Uh, and I don't think the regulators will ever be able to offset that. So it, not only um, do I think that government regulation does an inferior job of the private sector regulation, I think there's considerable evidence to suggest that the, pro the public sector regulation crowds out private sector regulation in that at the end of the day, we actually have less regulation total, public and private combined, than we would in a purely private world. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.